Okay, welcome to the 12 p.m. Zoom meeting for Math 1401, Monday, uh, January 25th. And we have a participant, Ms. Allen. I can see your name on the screen. Have you got any questions for today? You showing mute, so if- um, I don't have any questions right now, I'm just, here, are you going to do like a lesson plan today? Yeah, I probably will. This will probably take about 10 minutes to do everything they're doing in this section. Okay, great. And then, uh, yeah, we can open it up and try to uh, get an example problem. So I'll go over the assignment first. Yeah, we're finishing the first unit here, chapter one, section two, one and two, two. So we got no quiz this week over just two, two. We will give test one on Friday this week and make it do Sunday. Same format as the quiz, it will be longer. Cover chapter one, two, one, and two, two. We will again, yeah, I have problems all worked out. You'll enter true or false, depending on whether the problem is correct. You will be allowed one submission only. So the Google form will be configured to give you one submission only. Uh, so yeah, be careful when you enter. You will not uh, receive an immediate grade as well. Uh, I'm going to set a cutoff date when I mail out the test. And um, it will be after Sunday. I'm going to say it's due Sunday, but there's always people email. I got this happen. I got that happening and can't get it done by Sunday. So I'm going to have an absolute cutoff date um, that I will not check tests after that date. It'll be a couple days after. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just to prevent students, I've had a problem with students using, because I only give one submission using non-UNG emails, and they um, puzzle out the um, answers because they're true or false, and then they can go in, enter their UNG email, and uh, they know exactly what the answers are. So I'm going to try using this. Um, I'm going to set the form to not give you your grade. And then after my deadline, I'm gonna set the form, it will mail out the grades. Uh, section 2.2 then, our practice problems, uh, seven to 27 odd. These problems are on test one, but there's no specific quiz over them, just them. Uh, in my lab statistics, uh, I went through it last night and got the headings. You're under 2.2, all chapters, study plan, all chapters. Chapter two is summarizing data in tables and graphs. Under 2.2, organizing quantitative data, then they have these headings and these are the exact problems and numbers that I went through. Um, you should be able to work. Uh, here they are under construct histograms of continuous data, under draw stem and leaf plots, and identify the shape of a distribution. I counted 24 total problems, then you can just email me the percent of these 24 problems that you get correct. And so, yeah, I need kind of need to go over what all these new things, different things mean. So organizing quantitative data, 'll uh, it's going to be very similar some a lot of similarities to 2 one but there are some important differences as well. There'll be a frequency distribution table. In a normal class I would go around the room take a little survey uh, of some quantitative data but um, don't really have the class in front of me and we have only one person here. So tough to gather up a set of data. Let's, I don't know if I can pick one out or I just make it up. Um, let's see, two, two. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of data tables here. It's tough to copy it all down. Oh boy. Um, so, you know, for an example, this is arrivals at Wendy's um, during the lunch hour. I don't know if I want to copy all this down, but there's a sample data table. 
typical number of, of arrivals at lunchtime at Wendy's. So he selects 40 randomly selected 15 minutes of intervals of time during lunch. Uh, for example, during one 15 minute interval, seven quest, uh, customers arrived. So there's the data. That's probably a little long. Or if I did the whole thing, why don't I do the first three columns? I can handle that. And that'll show you an example of how it goes. Well, this is page 74, um, table eight. First three columns. Number of arrivals at Wendy's. Or customers. During their lunch hour. I've got uh, seven, five, two, six, two, six, six, seven, five, two, and six, six, one, five, and nine, and it goes on. All right, so what we would do as a general rule, your in a frequency distribution table, we'll call that F D T. Frequency, our frequency distribution table. First column we'll call classes. Classes. And again, there's no single correct way to do this. Um, I can do it one way, somebody else can do it another. Oh, we're up to four participants. Very good. We're going over section two, two. I've just uh, covered the assignment and we're charging into, um, there's more than a few things going on here in 2.2. So we're getting a little bit brief lesson here on 2.2. We're doing a frequency distribution table. They've got the first three columns of table eight. I didn't write down the page number, probably should have. Oh, I did, I'm sorry, it is right there, it's page 74. So I'm gonna do it, uh, we're going up to seven. I could go one to three, three, yeah. Um, I'll try one to two customers between three and four customers, five to six customers, and let's say seven to eight customers. So then there's a bit of a vocabulary to this. These are called classes. This is called the lower limit of the class. Numbers on this side are called the upper limit of the class. And the class width, hey, it doesn't seem to be much delay here. First couple of 12 o'clock classes I've done here, we, there's been a lot of Wi-Fi delay, like, I mean, like up to 30 seconds or whatever, but it's working great today. Uh, usually I take the first class and just subtract the two. So two minus one, we'll take it to be one. But, you know, as you go through, you'll see that sometimes classes further down can have a slightly different width. I don't let that bother me. I usually just use the first class. All right, well, then you have frequencies. And so just like before, I want to count how many of these numbers appear in each of these intervals. So how many between one and two? Well, we've got a one there, two there. Uh, three, three. Looks like I get four of them. Maybe we ought to pause for station identification. Are we losing anybody? Might want to take yourself off mute, maybe. Can't quite hear you. Still here. Okay. Are we losing anybody? No, sir. Oh, okay. Mike. Cross them off just so I don't wind up losing them again. As you, you can cross them off or you can just you know leave them alone. All right, the numbers between three and four. Nothing here. Nothing here. Wow, nothing here. So there's zero of them between three and four. Five and six. We got one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. I uh, got eight of them between five and six. 
Looks like between seven and eight, I've got two of them. Doggone, I didn't notice a nine, so I guess I should have had one from nine to 10. There's one of them from nine to 10. So that is how the numbers are distributed through the classes. All right, and then this next stuff is very similar. We're gonna total this up. I get 12, I get 15 here. Our relative frequencies, again, what part of this is of the whole. So I divide by the total, each one by the total. I usually keep a couple of places. Two, I'll call it two seven, zero there, eight divided by 15, five three, two divided by 15, one three. Wi Fi is working good today. Uh, maybe I've been better comment on it. Don't want to uh, jinx it. Okay, so you have your relative frequencies. Now, before in 2.1, we went on and did a bar graph, but it's a similar thing, but it's called a histogram. Now we're gonna draw a histogram. Now, this is more organized than in 2.1 because with numbers, this is so you say your X axis and you're gonna do it in order. You can't just randomly rearrange it with numbers like you did in 2.1 because 2.1 was just labels. It doesn't matter what order the labels are in. Hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay, yeah, I should look at the chat. My mic isn't working right now, but I was wondering if the problem will always specify the class width. Uh, no, it won't. Uh, am I supposed to type the chat or can y'all hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, no, it won't. You, in fact, I'll show you problems. Later on in the section, they give you a set of data and you're allowed to make up your own classes. So I'll just, you know, just point to it. Yeah. Uh, so for example, I think the last problem, and there may be some others, uh, like 27 here, maybe I should get this off the screen. I don't know if y'all are seeing this. Okay. Um, they ask if these are discrete or continuous data. This is the number of televisions in households. Hopefully you'd know that would be discrete and then construct a frequency distribution of the data. And they're not telling you how to set up your classes. You're kind of free to do it uh, however you want. You could peek at the back of the book and do it their way, but if you did it a different way, it isn't wrong. So no, they do not always give you the class widths. You can kind of, on a lot of the stuff, you can make them up. Was there another question in the chat? Oh, okay, thank you. Got it. I appreciate it. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to do this in order one to two, three to four, uh, five to six, seven to eight and nine to 10. Uh, once again, this can be either frequency or relative frequency. In other words, I can either do it by these decimals or by the exact frequency numbers up to eight, maybe I'll just do them by the direct frequency numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Was there another question in the chat? Keep hearing dings. No, that's probably my email. Okay, so one to two is up to four. Now what happens is I'm gonna widen the bars to touch. We'll explain why in a minute. Okay, so up four, one, two, three, four. Three and four was zero. Uh, five to six was up to eight. Seven to eight was up to two. Nine to 10 was at one. Questions about that?
Okay, we're going to connect the top of each bar with a straight line. in the center, actually the center of the top. Go right there to right here and I draw straight lines. Center there, straight line. Center here, straight line. Center here, straight line. This sequence of straight lines is called a frequency Polygon. This gives rise to three distinct shapes of histograms. Shape one. You might have a center bar and then bars that go at the exact same height down to each side. So maybe you have some beginning bars and some ending bars over here. And if you connect tops of each bars, you smooth out and idealize you wind up with something like this. Anybody happen to have seen that before or know the name of that shape? Bell curve, all right. Somebody chatted with me, a bell curve, very good. That is one name of it. It's got, actually got three names, a bell curve. It's also called symmetric. It's also called normal. All three names are identical, mean the same thing. This curve is so important. It's going to be the entire subject of our class from chapter seven on. We'll do a bunch of different things through chapter six, probability in chapter five, discrete ones in chapter six. But from chapter seven on, this curve is the entire, this curve is the entire subject of our class subject of our class. And that is because this curve never occurs in the real world. You do not go out collect real world data from real people or from real animals or from real whatever counts. And you never get this curve. The reason it's the entire subject of our class though is because it has a formula and we can work with the formula for it. Why do you never get that curve? Because you never get, you never get this curve Maybe never is too harsh, almost never. 
get this curve because there is nearly always a strange number collected. They call it a strange number. Anybody know the formal name for a strange number? Starts with O. Maybe somebody can tell me by the time I get to write this is called and blank. It starts with O. Do we need to play Wheel of Fortune? How about a U? That enough word letters? People hadn't heard of this word before? Need another letter? Can you get it from this? Is anybody still out there? People hadn't heard of this word before? I'll take a uh, guess, it might not be right though. Go ahead. Outfield. <laughs> okay, not quite. <laughs> Liar. Called an outlier. Somebody say it on the chat, probably. Outlier, yes, somebody said it on the chat. Very good, that is correct. They call this an outlier. Now, you can have outliers in each direction and that is where you get the other two shapes. So we'll call, call it shapes, shape two. A uh, strange number or an outlier, much bigger than other numbers. All right, this might arise. I'll uh, draw the idealized bell, but what happens is most of your data is here. All right, so this could be income. And you might have Bill Gates. Maybe actually it's, it's Jeff Bezos now. I, I used to use Bill Gates. He was the richest guy for a while, but he isn't anymore. It's Jeff Bezos, I think. Maybe I should switch my example to Jeff Bezos. Hope you guys know these people. I think he, uh, Jake Bezos is the rich. Everybody know Jeff Bezos? Heard the name? Yeah, he's the Amazon guy. Amazon guy, yeah. And, and I believe he's the richest guy now. It used to be Bill Gates, so I better update my examples. Uh, so yeah, you, you might, maybe your data, you, you got, you're comparing income on people and uh, oops, one of your guys is Jeff Bezos. So what happens is he has his own little bar and your tail extends out to the top of his bar. Now, why is his bar so small? He's supposed to be the super rich guy. Well, remember this is frequency or relative frequency. So he's one guy, whereas everybody else back here, you've, you've got the most people back here, us poor people are back here. There's a lot of people here. He's one guy. The income is expressed horizontally. So his income is incredibly much greater than everybody else. His bar vertically is small because he's just one guy, a strange number. If everybody was as rich as Jeff Bezos, he wouldn't be, you know, we'd all be, you know. Is this as clear as Lake Lanier? I think Elon Musk is the richest guy now. Uh-oh, who's that? Uh, Tesla guy. Oh, is he surpassed Bezos? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, maybe I'll uh, use him. I, I can also use height. You, you know, most people, uh, you know, well, a lot of people are within a normal range of height, but then you, you might have Shaquille O'Neal. We use height. Shaquille O'Neal. 
try to use people people have heard of. Again, he'd be one guy, but his height would be so much greater than everybody else. Okay, so for the third shape, we can kick out our rich guy and uh, tall guy, and we can put in some sort of number on the other side. So make this a thumb. And let's say we've got somebody. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned before I went on, the shape here is called a skew right. It's where your short bars are. You say your data is skewed to the right. All right, well, down here uh, in our income example, maybe you've got a, you know, a real poor guy, person. Or may, uh, maybe you have a horse jockey. And so most, most people are here. And our real poor person or our horse jockey are over here. Again, they're just one guy. But their income is so much less or their height is less income less or your height is less. I guess you'll never direct if this is a skew right I, I bet you never guess which direction this is skewed. You probably got to wait lay awake all night thinking up which direction this would be skewed. Anybody want to take a uh, take a shot? Skew left. Outstanding. You probably had to lay awake all night thinking that up. You got it. Yeah, this would be called a skew left. So there are your three standard shapes. And ordinarily, on my examples, I usually do get a shape going back to the connection we did. But uh, on this one, using just the first three columns of that data, it's really hard to call this any of the shapes um, just from the picture. We're going to uh, show you how to tell a shape and never look at a picture, but that's chapter three. All right, there's still a few other things to cover. Uh, any questions about this so far? There's Another way to organize data. They call it a stem and leaf. A stem and leaf plot. This really shines with two digit data. In my in-class, I usually use the time you drive to school. We've got five people here, I think still. Anybody here willing to tell us how long it would take you to drive to the college? Collect a little bit of data here. I can show you how stem and leaf is done. I ordinarily would take 15 minutes. Anybody else willing to tell us? Got a, somebody on the chat? 40 minutes. All right. Anybody else willing to tell us? About 20 minutes. 20 minutes, I heard. Can we get three more? 10. 10 minutes. Anybody else? Well, I'll just make up a few other numbers here. How about 20, just to pretend that I'm in a regular class, somebody 25, uh, 34, 51, 67, 55, 44, might do one more row uh, or column, um, 28, uh, 
62, 53, 45, 29. Okay, let's just say I've got asked a bunch of people and this is how long they take to drive to school. So on a STEM, this is time to drive to school. On a stem and leaf plot, you split the numbers sort of off, or you split off the higher order digit. And what they do, draw a line and they label the left side stems, and this is the higher order digit. These are called leaves, leaf or leaves, I could use the plural. And these are the lower order digit. And they do this least to greatest. Horizontally. These are least to greatest vertically. Vertically. Probably think this is the most complicated thing in the world, but it is. And once you see it done, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world. In other words, what I do is I look through the whole data. I look for all the higher order digits. So I've got numbers in the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So there, that's all my examples, all the types of higher order digits that appeared. Now what I do is for each data number is I collect things horizontally, meaning there was a 10, so I just write a zero for the 10 and a five for the 15. Cross them off if you want, so you don't look at them again. I've used the 10 and 15. So this one is paired with each of these to construct the data. Are we losing anybody? All right, well now I go to 20s and I've got a zero for this 20 and I've got a five there and an eight there. Did we lose? Oh, a nine. I'm sorry, I missed a nine. I've got a 29. Did we, did we miss anybody? Or are we losing anybody? All right, well, let's jump to the 30s. I see a 34. Is that the only 30 I wrote down? Just got a one four, a 34. All right, if we go to the 40s, we got a zero for this 40. 44 and a 45, so I write down a four and a five. Fifties, I've got a one and a five. 51, 55, 53. I'm sorry, I missed a three in there. My fault. There's a 53. In the 60s, I've got a two and a seven for a 62 and a 67. And I think I've counted for all that. All right, if you wondered what the advantage of this kind of uh, diagram is, it allows you to keep track of exactly the data that you're using. And if you'll twist your paper horizontally, now the rows of numbers look like vertical bars. And you can almost puzzle out a shape. Uh, a little tough because you got a really short one there, but uh, it, you can almost imagine a skew right kind of shape here.
in the homework, they're actually going to make you start with this stem and leaf and make you recover the, uh, the original data. I can give you an example of that, but it should be pretty straightforward. You just pair each of these numbers with each of the uh, values over there. Have we lost anybody? Thirty-five minutes gives us some time to work some homework examples. I don't know why the Wi-Fi is working so good today. If you were here in any of the earlier meetings, it wasn't working near this good. Does anybody want to say anything? I do have one question. Sure. Um, how many questions are going to be on the test this week? Look for 20. OK, thank you. Uh -huh. Are we ready to charge into some uh, homework examples then? Yes, sir. OK. Well, it starts in on Page 87, problem seven. And they ask a true or false question. The shape of the distribution shows a skewed left. Uh, you probably can see the answer there. They ask true or false, is this skewed left? Can you tell? Again, you don't have to imagine a curve and look where the low bars are. Can you tell? that it's actually skewed which way? Nobody wants to talk today. Is it obvious to everyone that this is a skew right? Yes. Okay. That may make the answer false because they say true or false, it's skewed left, and that would be false. It's not skewed left. All right. Number nine, they have rolled two dice and they have they rolled it to a hundred times. And they took a histogram of the sum that was shown. And so then they ask a few questions up here in part A. So it's tough to get it all on the uh, screen because they got the questions up here at the top. Uh, what was the, this, so this is page 87, number nine, part A. Can you tell what was the most frequent outcome? This is called an experiment. They roll in two dice a hundred times. Can you tell what the most frequent outcome was? Eight. Eight. Rolling eight. What was the least frequent? Two. See, like it's two. How many times did you observe a seven? Your seven. 15. Yeah. Did I hear 15? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, 15 times seven out of the hundred, the seven got rolled. How many more fives than fours? Part D. Well, fives was what? Can you tell? You want to call that 11? How many more fives and fours? Well, there was like 11 fives. What do you want to call fours? See, this is where things get fuzzy. Definitely above five. You want to call it six or seven? Yeah, maybe seven. Maybe seven. So how many more fives and fours? 11 minus seven looks like it'd be four more. Yeah, so 
apparently we guessed right or guessed the same way the book did because that's what they're getting. They're getting four. In part E, determine the percentage of time a seven was observed. Well, that's so easy. They, they rolled 100 times. Percent time, roll a seven. Well, that'd be 15 times out of 100. That would be the definition of 15%. All right, this is where F gets a little fuzzy. Describe shape. Well, we said a symmetric would have the same heights each side, and it clearly doesn't do that. So the book is, you see the answer on the book is bell-shaped. Book's going to call this a symmetric, even though, you know, slightly lower over here than you are here and everything. In other words, there is a difference between perfectly symmetric versus, say, approximately symmetric. Like I say, things are a little fuzzy. So even though this isn't perfect, you still have low bars each side and they're still gonna call it bell-shaped, even if it isn't perfect. So you can call it approximately symmetric, you can even call it bell-shaped. Questions about this? If you go to problem, 13 or 14, we can try a couple of these. You read a situation, page 88, <coughs> say problem 13. You read, and describe a shape. Oh, by the way, there's one more, your choices are, Bell, skew right, skew left. They also give you another one called uniform, didn't mention. That's because this never occurs in the real world either. I don't know why they even mess with it. A uniform means all the bars are exactly the same height. It would be like we all make $20,000 a year. Not 20,001, not 19,999. Everybody makes 20,000 a year. Can you see basically this never happens? But if it did, it would be called uniform. Nobody's exactly the same. All bar on a uniform, all bars the same height. Okay, you wanna try 13A? See if anybody can take a shot at this. Annual household incomes. Shape. Bell. Even uniform, I'll give it the order they did. Uniform. Skew right, skew left. Can we eliminate uniform right off the bat? That would be like everybody in the US makes $20,000 a year. Did everybody know that, that that's not the case in the US, right? Can we, can we just instantly eliminate uniform? Anybody wanna take a shot at any of the other three? Oh, we got some more chats here. Okay. 
Can we get anybody to take a shot at what the other three might be? Nobody wants to take a shot. Should we throw darts at the board? Put these three words up in there. Is, is that make sense to everybody, or does anybody want uh, an explanation? If y'all are trying to talk to me, a lot of y'all are, I think, muted. Because I got my volume up. Who wants my absolutely brilliant explanation? Me, okay, Miss Stiller wants my absolutely brilliant explanation. All right, the way I always, on any of these, the way I always start is I imagine a bell. So if it was a bell, and this is income, These are super rich people, and these are super poor people. So this is where it helps to know something about the underlying subject, conditions in our country. This says that there are just as many rich people in this country as there are poor people. Is that the case in our good old United States of America? Are there just as many rich people in our country as there are poor people? No. Okay, everybody, everybody know that that's no. No, that's not the case in our wonderful country. So we can eliminate Bell. So given between these two, can you tell which it would be? I'll draw them both, see if you can imagine it. Skew right would look like this. Again, this is income. A skew left would look like this. Does anybody know which situation would describe our good old United States of America? Again, this is rich, this is poor. I'll use, uh, talk about this one, this is skew left. This says everybody makes about the same, but we've got a very few poor people. Does that describe the good old United States of America? Can anybody tell? Is this just baffling? Sorry, can you repeat what you said? My uh, audio cut out for a second. Okay. About the skew left? Yes, please. Okay. This says everybody makes about the same money, but we have a very few poor people in this country. Does that describe the good old United States of America? No. No, it really doesn't. Does everybody know that? This says we've got a very few rich people in this country and we've got everybody else making about the same. 
Does that describe the good old United States of America? Actually, it does. Last I read, I read an article, there's about 500 billionaires in our country and our total population is around 320 million. So you have 320 million people in this country and about 500 billionaires. That's uh, 500 billionaires out of 320 million is not a lot. So yeah, that's a very few rich people and we got everybody else making about the same. This goes to the issue of in income inequality. Is income inequality a uh, problem in our country? Or, you know, does it exist, et cetera? So yeah, it would, uh, it would be skewed right for this situation. Now there are, that's the US, there are countries where other shapes actually plot. Anybody think of a country maybe that uh, is actually skewed left? They exist. You, you got a lot of people making about the same and very few poor people. Can anybody think of uh, any countries like that? Circle spinning. Oh, you ever heard of Monaco? It's in Europe. Where a lot of people go to gamble. It's a very small country and a lot of rich people there. And they hire in their servants. How about Brunei? Is that what it's called? I can't probably can't even spell it. I'll embarrass myself. Is it EI or you know, in, in um, Middle East. You ever read, it, read anything about Brunei? Playground for the rich. You could actually, I think, go skiing indoors. <laughs> They're so rich in the middle of the Middle East with all that hot weather. They, they, I think they've actually got an indoor ski resort. They, they manufacture the snow and keep it cold enough to keep it there. You could actually go skiing. Anybody heard of these countries? Okay, I got some more chats here. Right, yes, okay. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, we're at 52 minutes. I don't know if we're trying your patience. Uh, let's see, let y'all play with those. Let uh, try 19, a stem and leaf. This is page 89. And they want you to determine, they give you a stem and leaf. They want you to determine the original set of data. I won't do the whole thing. I'll just, uh, first couple rows, you get zero, one, and four, and then on two, you got a two fours, a seven, and a nine. And everybody tell your original set of data, 10, 11, 14. Sharing this one with each of these, 21, 24, 224s, and 27, 29. And you could do the rest of it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Do we need to... Um, Give you any other example. 23 is where they have you start drawing tables. They give you the directions up here. Find the number of, okay, you're actually, they, they give you the tables. They want you to find the number of classes, the class limits, and the class width. Do we need an example of any of that? So 25, they're reaching back to 23. Okay, now they're reaching back to the same data in problem 25. And they want a relative frequency distribution, a frequency histogram, a relative frequency histogram, and then they answer the questions. 
Anybody need examples of all of that? Or do you think we've uh, opened up your heads and poured in enough today? I'm hearing nothing. Does this mean you're dying for more examples or are you just dying? Still hear nothing. Are we are we ready to end the meeting? Can I get an amen or are you want more? I'm good for today. Okay. Anybody else want more? Okay. I'm ho uh, again uh, planning on holding a 12 o'clock meeting Thursday and an 8 o'clock meeting Thursday. Going to pull it back an hour. So uh, if you look at this and you got more questions or everything, uh, please come out on Thursday. Otherwise, we'll look to end the meeting. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Sure thing. Same to you. We'll end the meeting. Let's see. Looks like we got another chat, maybe. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate y'all coming out. Maybe we'll see you on Thursday.